Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about why we need to learn and understand history. I'm delighted to welcome special guest Barbara Mojica. Barbara is a historian and retired educator and the author of the Little Miss History book series. You can reach Barbara at her website, littlemisshistory.com, or on her blog at bamauthor.me, and I'll include those links in the description. Welcome, Barbara. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Oh, I'm so happy to be with you. It's an honor. Thank you so much. You are so experienced in what you do. More than 40 years of teaching, and you've been a principal, and you've been on the administrative end. And even after retiring, you are continuing to teach through your books. And I I bought one of your Little Miss History books, and I read it so that I would be ready for today. And I'm just delighted. You are obviously very passionate about education and about history. I would love to know why this matters so much to you. Why, why is it so important that we need to know this? Okay. Well, my uh, foundation is that I was always driven internally by uh, a love of school and education. And that didn't come to naturally because both of my parents uh, were not highly educated. In fact, neither one of them finished high school. Mm. And I grew up in a fairly poor back- background, but I always had that need to know more and see more and do more. So uh, I made sure that I did. And I fell in love with history because I I was interested in learning about and meeting different kinds of people and going different places. But the way history used to be taught uh, was not all that fun. Uh, you know, it used to be presented as a series of facts and figures and events. And it's so much more than that. And when I came to history, I saw it as real people, real things, real lives. And, you know, to me, history is the biggest reality show ever because we're looking at people just like us. And when I teach history to children, I tell them that these people got up like we do. They eat breakfast, they go to school, go to work, and they have the same kind of problems that we do. So that's the way I initially approached it. But I realized later on, as as I studied more and more history, that there's such a deep connection with our families, uh, our communities, and history connects us to our past, and it helps us to live in our present day, and it also gives us a path to the future. So it's always an evolution. It's not something that's stagnant. It's not finished and dead. Uh, We have to know where we came from in order to know where we're going. So that's the way I approach uh, history. But when I began writing my books, and I did that after a long career in education, and, and that was a winding road too, because as I studied history, I, I went to graduate school, I got a graduate degree in history, and then I thought, okay, what am I going to do with this? And I thought first that I would teach in higher education or either high school or college. But I didn't relate to that age group that well. I always loved young kids. And I decided, gee, I think I want to just go teach for a while. So here I was, finished college at age 20, uh, because I did it in three years. I was in such a rush to learn so much. I took all kinds of supplementary courses during the summer and, and... And I kind of complemented all of my interests. I took courses in anthropology and the history of art and uh, classics. And, you know, I just wanted to get the whole picture. So that's what I did. And and here I am at 20 and, okay, uh, I need to get my first job. So I got a job teaching 
uh, in a school, uh, an elementary school, and my very first class was a class of fifth graders, uh, 56 of them. Whoa. <laughs> so, so here That's I was walking class. into the classroom, and in the, those days the classes were large. Uh, this is a private school, so they were even maybe even larger than public school at the time. So I was terrified. <laughs> I won't make any bones about it. But I just went in and I did it, and I loved it. And um, the, and I, I wound up in elementary school for 20 years. So I taught for 20 years in elementary school, and then I realized, you know, hey, um, I see that children are so different and – you know, there are a lot of children that aren't making it in this regular classroom. So I began to notice, of course, as I went along, the more and more of the special needs of children. So I went into special education. I went, you know, back to school and went into special education. Uh, I got a job in a special ed preschool. And uh, that was another experience just thrown into the totally unprepared because in the special ed preschool, these children had severe delays. So mm. all of a sudden, I'm dealing with autistic children, crack cocaine babies, mm. uh, all kinds of behavioral issues, uh, medical conditions like fragile X syndrome and CP and, and and here I said, this was another whole new learning curve for me. So, uh, I, I worked hard at, at working with these kids and I had great teamwork because, um, you know, we were supported by speech therapists and, um, occupational therapists, physical therapists, all of, all of the support staff that these children needed, psychologists, the, the whole nine yards. And, I learned so much from all of these people, but I learned along the way that parents are, you know, are the first teachers. And of course, being a parent myself and a grandparent now, uh, I began getting more and more interested in the ways that parents could become involved in education. So I started to do research on that. I started to implement those techniques into my classroom. And then an opportunity arose for me to become the principal of the special ed school in which I worked. And I had to go back to school for that, of course, because I needed New York State certification in in, uh, administration. So there there I went again. And... um, I happened to um, get get my degree, uh, get administration, and uh, I became the principal of this school, and that was a whole new learning experience again. Uh, I had to deal with a lot of bureaucracy. I had to deal with the state. I had to deal with the city. I had to um, rationalize every decision I made, and sometimes the the well-being of the children wasn't first. It was the other issues, money and budget. And again, I saw how parents were being left out of that equation. So I made another switch. And a few a few years after that, I took a position as a special ed administrator with New York City. And I worked with a very large district in New York City, which was full of diverse groups of people, some of them at the very high end of the income scale and others at the very low end. And I became an advocate for children. Uh, I was responsible for evaluating and um, determining their special needs and then placing them in the proper kind of environment. So here I became very, very uh, close to the parents in, in that equation getting parents involved with their rights, uh, knowing what they needed to do and helping them fight for their rights when they didn't get them. But again, this is history, but you see how my path has evolved and it, it, it is 
my reality show. I mean, I'm this, 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 this is my reality. And um, I, in my books, I kind of take all of this, and it's always behind the scenes. Um, I'm teaching children, I'm trying to get parents involved in the history as well, because in my books, I try always to reveal little known facts, uh, little known events, uh, um, get a lot more diversification into the books, and uh, also uh, connect the parents and the teachers more with their community. So my hope is that they will actually visit and experience the, the sites that I write about. Wow. Okay, Barbara. I have to say, I the one of your books that I read was about Independence Hall, and I thought, uh-huh. oh, I kind of want to go there. So if that is the goal, you know, I because that is not one of the historical spots that I have been to visit. So it did kind of inspire me to th- think, oh, that would be that would be a good trip. I think I should go see that. Um, you have such a a broad variety of things we could talk about. I thought we were going to be talking about why history matters, but you're also working with special needs, parents, parents' rights, how to improve education, this whole broad thing. We could go so many different directions and we have, you know, a a limited amount of time. Where do you feel that you want to go today? What message do you feel would be most important at this time to share with those who are listening? Um, What will help us to, to be better parents, what will help us to be better uh, members of our community? What will help us? I mean, where should we go? Well, I think uh, in talking about the value of, of history uh, today, uh, I think parents as the first teachers should get their children involved with history. And there are a lot of ways they can do that. Uh, first of all, within the family, uh, helping a child, even a very young child, discover his or her place in the family. And there are so many ways to do that. Um, We always come back to the basic questions, and and, and what do children do? They do nothing but ask questions all the time. So they want to know who and what and when and why and how this works and how this happens. So parents can just use two simple words, uh, I wonder. And in in talking about their own family, you know, I wonder how grandma went to school. I wonder how, what kind of job grandma had. I wonder what it was like where she lived. I wonder about who were the kinds of people that she talked what were the kind of foods that she ate? So that connecting them and, and, and asking the, the child, well, maybe um, I could look into that. Uh, maybe I could draw, even a very young child can, can look at pictures, can draw things. It doesn't have to be right or interview, uh, you know, uh, as an older child could do. And you could take a child around in your, in your own community. You don't have to make a big trip. Uh, but just walking around and, and asking them to notice things like, Oh, I wonder who lives there. I wonder where that old house came from. Um, I wonder how my community got its name. Uh, I wonder what people thought about long ago. How, you know, uh, this street looks very uh, different now than it did 50 years ago. Well, just give a child a camera. Let a child take pictures of the things that they're curious about and then go back and ask all of those questions. Uh, Every every community is, is, is wrapped in memory. I mean, if you don't have memories, you don't have a community, just as if, you know, just like if you don't have family members, that's what makes a family. 
what's the first thing we want when when uh, we're a child and um, we want we're going to bed at night? We, oh, can you tell me a story? Well, we can tell children stories about real people and real places and, and real events and uh, the, the, all of these things are what give us our identity and parents can teach children those, those things. Parents can uh, teach children uh, how to be curious about things, how, uh, you know, how important it is to follow through and, and, and how, how important it is to, uh, to try new things and, and discover new passions and, um, and ch- help them realize that change is inevitable because a lot of children are afraid of change. They don't, they don't like the idea of going to new school. They, they become extremely fearful if a parent tells them, well, we're going to move. They, they don't want to change. But we can help them realize that change is an important part of life. And that is history. Right? That it is always changing. It's always evolving. And we are always changing. We are always in, in, um, evolving. And part of history is uh, learning how to think critically. And I'm afraid that's not done in our schools today. We're not really teaching them critical thinking. We're teaching to the test. And uh, to a great extent, we're not uh, teaching them basic skills. We're not teaching them reading. We're not teaching them writing. We're not teaching them arithmetic. We're teaching them how to pass a test. And and meet some kind of arbitrary standard that's not necessarily going to meet their needs today, and it probably won't meet their needs in the future because we don't even know where we're going in the future at at the rate that technology is changing, Um, that, you know, we can't even uh, envision that. uh, But if we study history, we can come up with better solutions. You know, I always say it's kind of like a math equation. I mean, yesterday plus what we're doing today is going to equal how we proceed in the future. And by looking at history, we discover the things in the past that were done in a good way and and led to progress. And the the things that were done in the past that had devastating consequences. So it it helps us to prepare our our path for the future. And legacy, the legacy of history is that. But it teaches us, it warns us, it gives us a means to um, explain our shared past and and to uh, examine documents and artifacts and images which today uh, we've lost a lot of that. Um, critical thinking and, uh, and in the age of the 21st century, everything is opinion and social media and how do we want to be seen in the world? Not necessarily what is really going on. Hmm. Boy, and there's such a distinction between how we want to be seen and what is really going on. Okay, I would love to go back just a little bit as you talk about looking at history. And I loved that the I I wonder, I loved the I wonder. And as you're talking about finding solutions to things, if we came with that, I wonder how they handled this change. What what worked? What what didn't work? I wonder how... Uh, you know, how did someone else handle this? As we find out different ways that different people solved problems, it can help spark ideas for how to solve our things. And I love when you talk a little bit about education and the idea of teaching to a test instead of taking the I wonder and that natural curiosity and uh, building it and working with it and enhancing it We have a tendency in some of the standard let's teach to the test scenarios to take that I wonder and that curiosity and smash it, 
smash it and disintegrate it so that by the time we're adults, we don't have wonder. We don't have curiosity. We have go to work, do this, pay the bills, make the next thing and, and lose that. I wonder. So that is, I think that's part of the magic is not just studying history, but studying it with a sense of curiosity and wonder. And I would say even appreciation of recognizing things that have been done. So that's, that's, um, hopeful and concerning, I would say, because I don't feel like the direction we're currently taking, it seems to take very much that, how do things appear? How does it look? And, and a school wants to look good, look successful. Yeah. And the way that we measure is through tests. And if you want to look good on the test, then you study for the test. And it doesn't match what is happening inside of the child. It, it's not making the child a better person. It's not making them better prepared for their future role in society or their joy as a human, it's just helping the institution look good. And that's what's wrong with our educational system. And now a a lot of parents uh, were in the dark about that. They really didn't know what was going on uh, in, in in the classroom. And then COVID came along and all of a sudden they became aware of Hey, look! Look at what my child is learning, and 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 they didn't agree with a lot of what they saw their child learning, uh, and they are now becoming a lot more involved. So that's a good thing. That that's very hopeful to me. Uh, that the parents who are a child's first teacher are now becoming so so much more involved in, in, in child's education. Because parents, you know, as, as, as we grow older, where a, a child can, can focus so much, we, sometimes we think, oh, ch- child can't sit still. Always up. But actually, a child can focus on a problem a lot better than an adult can, especially an adult of the 21st century. Really? Because we're highly distracted. We're, we're, we're doing four things at once. We're checking our email. We're, uh, looking at a, at a video. And at, at the same time, we're kind of half listening to our, the child in the background saying, Hey, no, 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 no. We're not, we're not focused on anything. But when a child becomes interested in something, that child maintains the focus. I mean, it could be something so simple like a, a, a child comes across a pile of dirt and the child can use her imagination to see so much possibility in that pile of dirt. Oh, I could make this. And the child will, will tend to stick with that project until the project is finished. An adult won't. And, um, you know, uh, we, we are unable to finish what we start because we're, we're just all over the place. We're just so, and then the other thing is the inability to distinguish, uh, between what a fact is and, and, and what is really going on because we have all of the these powerful forces that have kind of taken control of media and um, what used to be news or a, a reporting of, of a situation very often today is now it's an editorial it, and mm. depending on who you happen to listen to you're going to say, oh, well, this is what happened. Uh, and some people use that to go on social media and then uh, project, well, this is what I heard happened, so this is what happened. And then one of their friends agrees, 
And they say, see, I'm right because my friend agrees with me. So it's this kind of social group think uh, that is is creating such a division uh, of, among people. Uh, and it's kind of, I, I think, um, it's, it's kind of ironic that social media and the advances in technology are supposed to bring us together and create community. But in a lot of instances, they don't do that at all. They just create click. Divisiveness. And it's divisive. And it's it's gotten to the point where some people aren't even willing to hear anybody other person view. It's kind of like this uh everything is black and white. Well, this is what I think, this is what all of my other friends think. So okay, this must be the way it it is. And then there are other people who, you know, just see it as a power struggle, kind of like uh, well, uh I'm an authority and I have lots of experience in this. So what I think must be right. Did they look at the facts? Did they look at, you know, again, it goes back to critical thinking, which is what a historian does and what a scientist does, because history is a lot like science. The word history itself means to, to seek knowledge, to, to know, to look into. It does. And um, yeah, from the ancient Greek, that's what it means to seek. To look into. Didn't know uh, that. And most people look at the word history, the translation in English, and they see the word story. In. So, oh, it, it must be a story. And then again, another thing with 21st century, well, should it be history or her story? I mean, or, okay, again, we've totally corrupted the situation. Uh, so, whether you think you're an authority, whether it's because of social thinking, whether uh, it, it's because of your ego or uh, seeing things in black and white, a lot of our thinking today uh, is not critical thinking because it's judgmental. And that's the last thing mm. you would do as a historian. As a historian, you first focus on a problem and you observe it. And then you, you research and you gather information about it. Uh, you analyze that information. And the information you use ideally should be a primary source, letters, journals, artifacts, fossils, remains, whatever that actually comes from that period of time. Not a secondary source, which would be like, you know, a magazine article written by someone or what's written in the encyclopedia uh, or an opinion editorial that's a secondary source written later on. And uh, they that's not what should be the focus because a real a historian uses citations from those primary sources. And only then can you make the connections who is doing it? Why was it being done? And the connections are, again, people from that time. They have influences upon them, too. So you can't come to a conclusion until you see how all of those other forces were influencing this one, one person or one event that you're studying. So you can't say definitively that the person did this or, or thought this until you investigate that. And then how is it communicated? Because how uh, history was communicated 500 years ago is a lot different than how history is communicated today. So that plays a big part uh, of the prejudices and the... Uh, it, the way it was communicated, okay? So in, in colonial times, like in the time of the Independence Hall book, the newspaper reported the fact, and most people got their information that way, or from a letter. But if, if it's not something that was filtered through a lot of other people, and um, a, a, there was not much opinion in 
involved in. You had an editorial section in the newspaper, but everybody knew that that editorial was one person's opinion. The rest of it was news. We don't have that today. We get our we get our news through a journalist that is likely to report it from a particular point of view. Mm-hmm. That's very true. Okay, I feel like. I appreciate all of the things that have been brought up and recognizing what some of the issues are. And and I don't think we can solve a problem until we are aware of what it is. But I always love to go to what can I do about it? I loved when you talked about that, that silver lining of COVID and how it helped so many parents become aware and recognize a, a what's going on in their children's education. And of necessity, parents have been involved more in their children's education. And some have really taken that responsibility and just gone with it. And others can't wait to pass it back and to jump into other things that they're working on. And it depends on, you know, where they're at. But I love that you brought up that it is it was an opportunity. That's another silver lining. COVID stinks and we're so tired of it. But it's it's kind of good to be reminded of these silver lining things that have come about. So I my part of my takeaway for parents and the education of their children is to be aware and to be involved. And I loved when you talked about, I wonder, and adding that element of wonder and curiosity and kind of relaxing a little bit on the the testing and just let's wonder and let's discover. And I loved your comments all about social media and some of the things that it, it has some, I mean, everything has its pros and cons and depending on how you use it. It might have more pros than cons, or depending on how you're using it, it may have a lot more cons than pros. My feeling is I don't use it very much because I, I, I don't really like it. I I like, there's too many ads and I, I, I don't get the part that I want, which is what people are doing. So I just don't go there very much. Well, the original intention was to connect people and to bring them closer together, but and done that. yes and if the way you're using social media creates that end for you then bravo keep going but i have unfortunately lots of friends and associates where their takeaway is either that the anger the angst the us and them or the man, their life is so much cooler than mine. You went on an awesome vacation. I didn't get to go on an awesome vacation. Oh, they got a new car. I didn't get a new car. And you know, there's that kind of thing as well. So I think it depends on how you're using it. How do you feel when you're using it? I guess that would be my barometer. How, how do you feel? And if if you're not feeling good when you're doing it, then maybe maybe it's time to pick up a history book and read and do something a little different. And children are being so affected by it. I mean, a, a lot of children's social image is, is, is so impacted by social media. And they spend so much time trying to become popular, trying to be like their peers, trying to find out what's, quote, cool, uh, you know, how. How can I look like this person? How can I be like this person? And they are, they're really uh, having severe mental health problems and some of them even become suicidal and, and, and wind up ruining, ruining lives of, for themselves and, exactly. and, and for their families and, and just think about who they could be. Right. And, mm-hmm all of the opportunity that's lost. Uh, but there, I mean, I think there is hope. I think we're all waking up, and and I think that we will find a better way to, to use it. Oh, goodness. Is there any last things that you want to add before we wrap up for today? 
Well, I would end just with uh, the quote that my 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 character, my little Miss History, who narrates all of the books, uh, which are completely nonfiction. She's just kind of a narrator to make it fun for kids. But her her quote, her motto is, "If you don't know your history, you don't know what you're talking about." And I think that that's just as true today in the 21st century as it was. If you go way, way back to prehistory. Excellent. Thank you for that. And thank you for visiting with me today. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Me too. In closing, I'd also like to share a quote, and mine is by Michael Crichton. He said, If you don't know history, then you don't know anything. You are a leaf that doesn't know it is part of a tree. Today, I invite you to become aware of the importance of learning about the past and recognizing your role and responsibility as a character in history. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Linda's Corner, please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. I also invite you to check out my nonprofit, Hope for Healing, at the website hopeforhealingfoundation.org for free ebooks, free audiobooks, and other free resources to help increase happiness, build confidence and self esteem, strengthen relationships, manage stress, and calm feelings of depression and anxiety. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed A Journey Through Depression, or Amazon bestseller You Got This, an action plan to calm fear, anxiety, worry, and stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner.